A better understanding of how compilers optimize code helps us write programs that meet our performance requirements. Nicholas Wirth famously described compilation as this formula. Compilation equals translation plus optimization. Compilers are very important to the software process because they determine the quality of the code. The amount of CPU resources required, memory accesses, and code size. During compilation, we start with a high-level language program and go through several phases. Initially, we parse the program to break it into statements and we create a symbol table for the various names in the program. Optimizations of that code are often just code optimizations are often broken into two types of phases. Machine independent optimizations are the sort of optimizations that we would do over a broad range of machines. Machine de dependent optimizations depend upon the particular processor and instruction set being used. Here's an arithmetic expression and here's our data flow graph for that expression. We can see that the data flow graph is three levels deep. The simplest way to generate code for this data flow graph is to walk through the graph and generate code at the various steps. We start with this node, A times B. We generate code that reads in A and B, performs the operation. We then move on to the node C minus D. We generate that code. Now that we have the input to the multiply, we can generate that code. One value is a constant, the other is a value that we already generated and have in a register. And finally, we perform the addition at the end. Here is code generated by a compiler for this same expression. This is more optimized code. It also uses the stack frame in order to hold variables. That accounts for the references to FP. We can generate code for control statements such as ifs using a similar strategy of walking through the control flow graph. Here's a simple example. We take the test, generate code that loads the variables and performs the test operation and, and then a conditional branch. We need to generate code for one case of the branch. At the end of that we need to jump around the test we're going to generate for the other part of the branch. Here's the code for the other part of the branch. We generate the code and then we can go on to execute other statements. Once again here is code generated by a compiler for this statement. This code uses the frame pointer to hold variables. Procedures are an important part of any large program and understanding how the code for procedures is generated helps us design efficient programs. Procedure linkage is the term used for the code required to enter and leave a procedure. We of course need to you do a basic procedure call and return, but we also need to manage parameters and results. We need to pass parameters in and return results back. Modern procedures use a stack in order to hold parameters and results. That allows us to call recursive functions and to call a, a deep, uh, the stack allows us to call functions recursively. We store local variables on the stack. So here we have two procedures that are in the process of being called by this program. The growth of the stack in this figure goes from top to bottom. The frame pointer points to the end of the last procedure frame. The stack pointer points to the end of the current procedure frame. The difference between the two tells us the size of PROC2's stack frame. So we can now access variables in PROC2 relative to the stack pointer. 
when we exit PROC2, we're going to use saved values to restore the stack pointer and frame pointer for PROC1. The ARM processor has defined a particular procedure linkage known as ARM Procedure Call Standard. This standard, among other things, defines how several registers are used. R0 through R3 are used to pass parameters in the procedure. If you have extra parameters, they're put on the stack frame. R0 holds the return value. R4 and through R7 are used to hold internal register values. R11 is the frame pointer. R13 is the stack pointer. R10 holds the limiting address on the stack size to check for overflows of the stack. Here is compiled code for a procedure call. You can see that the procedure call loads some parameters in, uh, does a call, and then um, upon the return uses a uh, uh, move to access the return value. We also need to be able to implement data structures such as arrays and structs. High-level language programs include several different types of data structures, arrays, structs, and so forth. These different types require different data layouts and different forms of address computation. In some cases, such as structs, we can compute the offsets at compile time. In others, such as arrays, we need to compute the offset into the data structure at runtime. Here's a one-dimensional array. In C, the name of the array is essentially a pointer to the zeroth element in the array. We can compute the address of an element in the array by adding the base address of the array to the offset and then dereferencing that pointer. In two-dimensional arrays, we have a choice to make. Does the left-hand index change fastest or the right-hand index change fastest? C uses a row major layout in which the right-hand index changes faster than the left-hand index. So in this example, we have A00 followed by A01, A02, and so forth. When we're finished, um, with that, we then go to A10, A11, and so on. So we, now we have the number of rows and the number of columns to consider in our address calculation. We can compute the address by multiplying the first index by M and then adding the offset J. In structures, we have static offsets. A pointer to the structure points to the zeroth element of the structure. If we know the size of each element in the structure, we can compute an offset at compile time from that base pointer. So for example, field one is four bytes. So to get to field two, we take a pointer and we add four bytes. Simplification of expressions is an easy and natural optimization. For example, constant folding. 8 plus 1 equals 9. We don't need to compute that at runtime. We can compute it at compile time. Why would anyone write such code? Well, first, if we've given symbolic names to important uh, const, well, first, if we've given symbolic names to important constants, then we may express some value in the program as the sum or some arithmetic expression of several different constants. Secondly, there are plenty of cases that the compiler itself generates code that includes expressions that can be folded. We can perform algebraic simplifications. Here we factor out A to get rid of one multiplication. We can also do strength reduction. For example, replacing an integer multiplication by 2 with a shift. Dead code elimination is a very useful optimization. People may inadvertently introduce dead code, or it may be a natural part of the compilation process. So in this case, we have a test for uh, false. False is never true, so we cannot execute the code in the true part of the statement, namely uh, this debug statement here.
since we're not going to execute the conditional code, we actually don't need the conditional test either. So we can perform dead code elimination twice. Why would that happen? Well, consider this code. We have a uh, parameter that turns on and off debugging. If debugging is turned off, then we don't need to execute that debug statement. So we can perform analysis of the control flow and in addition some amount of constant folding to help us identify dead code. Procedure inlining replaces a call to a procedure with the code of the procedure body itself. This allows us to eliminate the procedure linkage code. In this case we have a simple function foo and then we call foo later in the program. We can optimize that code to replace the foo call with the code of the body itself. Of course, substituting in the actual parameters for the formal parameters. C++ has an official inlining mechanism. Inlining is often efficient because we eliminate the uh, procedure linkage call, but in some cases it can actually decrease cache performance because when we use a procedure we have one set of instructions that we can keep in the cache for that operation. When we inline each copy is a separate set of instructions that occupy different parts of memory and therefore map differently into the cache. So in some cases, so in some cases we can get more misses by procedure inlining. Loops are, of course, a natural target for optimizations. We're interested in reducing the loop overhead, increasing the opportunities for pipelining, and also improving the performance of the memory system. Loop unrolling is a simple transformation that's useful in itself and also can be used to help build other optimizations. Here's a loop in which we execute this body a fixed number of times. We can replace it, for example, with a loop that's executed half as many times and we have two copies of the body inside the loop. We have to adjust the bodies to make sure that we are using the proper induction variable in each case. But now rather than execute four copies of the loop test, for example, we're only executing that twice. We can fully unroll a loop by making one copy of the loop body for every iteration of the loop. Loop fusion allows us to take two loops and combine them into a single loop. So here we have one loop. Here we have a second loop that's executed the same number of times but has its own body. We can combine that into a single loop that executes both the bodies. Now we've reduced the amount of loop overhead that we execute. Loop distribution is the opposite. We can take a single loop with a complex body and split it into several smaller loops. Efficient use of registers is important for generating good code. We can use strong algorithms to help us determine how we should map variables into registers. We want to choose a register to hold each variable and we want to determine the lifespan of each variable in the register. Once we're done with a variable, we can reuse the register for a different variable. Simple case is considering a single basic block. So here is a basic block with three statements. We have several variables and we have a lifetime graph that describes how those variables are used. The x-axis is time, the y-axis is the different variables. This graph shows when each variable is active. So now if we can find two variables that are not active at the same time, we can assign them to the same register because they won't conflict. 
instruction scheduling determines the order in which instructions are executed. This can sometimes allow us to take better advantage of the parallelism within the processor. Non-pipeline machines don't need instruction scheduling because the order of instructions doesn't affect resource utilization inside the processor. But in a pipeline machine, the execution time of one instruction depends upon the nearby instructions. So, for example, we may be using a function unit for another instruction, or we may not be done computing a given operand. We can use a reservation table to describe the utilization of the hardware resources. The columns are the different resources and the rows are the different instructions. We can build a table that shows how the instructions use different resources and we can use this to optimize how we execute the instructions. Software pipelining is a particular optimization scheduling algorithm that is designed to work across loop iterations. It reduces instruction latency in, iter in one given iteration, I, by inserting instructions from the next iteration. That's the pipelining from one loop iteration to the next. We can make sure that we efficiently use all the CPU resources by pipelining together different loop iterations. Given a set of operations, we need to select the instructions we're going to use to implement them. In many machines, there are several different ways to code a given expression. Some may be better than others. Some may be smaller in code. Some may make better use of registers. So for example, here's an expression that we've described as a data flow graph. We can use data flow graphs to describe the different instructions that are available. And then we can use template matching algorithms to compare the expression to the templates. Our goal is to make sure that every operation in the expression is covered by one of the templates. So in general, it may take several templates to cover the complete expression. In this case, we could use a multiply instruction and an add instruction. That's two templates for two instructions. Or if we have a multiply add instruction, that template happens to cover the complete expression. We can develop some heuristics for making the best use of our compiler. We need to understand the various optimization levels. In large programs, we often find that different modules of a code are compiled with different optimization flags. If we want to better understand what code the compiler is generating, many compilers will give us a mixed listing that combines the compiler uh, statements and the assembly code relating to each high-level language statement. Now, you may be tempted to modify the output of a compiler, but there are two problems with this. First, you may create incorrect code, and second, if you need to modify your program, you then have to not only modify the high-level language code and recompile it, but then you have to go back and redo your hand optimizations. Interpreters and just-in-time compilers are often used to help us implement abstract machines. An interpreter translates and executes program statements on the fly. BASIC is the classic example of an interpreted language. A just-in-time or JIT compiler compiles small sections of code into instructions, and then those are executed um, as needed. Java is the classic example of a JIT-oriented language. This approach reduces some translation overhead. It may require more memory. To summarize, compilers generate optimized code from high-level language source using several rounds of translation and optimization. Data structures require address calculations that are largely hidden from the programmer. We can use a variety of optimizations on both control and data aspects of the program.